Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to your Thursday edition of the Trader Merlin Show. Welcome. Uh, good to see you. Got some new people here. Doug Jerving. It's his first time uh, on the show, a long, long time YouTube watcher. Well, welcome to the show. Good to see you. Good to see you, Josh. Uh, something might be going on. Yeah, you could say that. I was going to run through and say everybody's names, but that would take just too long. So welcome, everybody. Good to see some regulars and some new faces. If you are new, click on that subscribe button so you're notified when we do the show live every day. Well, almost every day. Uh, Monday through Friday is typically the routine. So uh, if you guys have questions, feedback, comments, you can always email me at tradermerlin at gmail.com. But as Les asked me, he says... Is it better for your channel if we uh, put our co comments and questions down on the YouTube page? I said, yes, it actually is from a search engine optimization. Apparently, it's better for you guys to put your comments down below the YouTube video. Apparently, that helps me out. But anyway. All right, let's get into the topic du jour, which, uh, it, I mean, it's a sad one. Nobody likes this topic. It's just, uh, I don't know, it's, it's no good to see bloodshed and loss when this could have been totally averted through conversation and just diplomacy. But instead today, we got war. Missiles launched, and I'm sure there will be a uh, body count as people are probably dying because of this. Bottom line is, and I, and I was kind of questioning even putting this up here, markets love war. I mentioned this with you guys, uh, what, a week or two ago, and this is really starting to build up. It says, well, what is, what's the usual outcome of a situation like this? The day that there is the, the full-on assault, when it officially starts, there usually is a day or two, maybe even three, of down move in the equity markets or whatever, you know, the markets overall. And that'll go for like two or three days, and all of a sudden, it will rip and just have a huge move to the upside as, uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure why, but I guess we can make the argument that they're thinking that um, – Publicly traded companies will do well because there's going to be more need for their services and, and getting resources over to fight this war, whether that's defense stocks or natural resources, etc. So there's that general belief system out there. Today was nuts. I'll tell you, when I woke up this morning, um, I was laying in bed and I just pulled up my phone and pulled up a couple of my accounts. And uh, as you guys know, I have 85 puts or yeah, 85 puts on right now, 50 Russell and 35 S&P. And I was looking at those gains. I'm like, this is going to be huge. And I'm laying there and I'm like, you know what? <sighs> my game plan was two to three days after the invasion, that's when I would close out my short position because I was expecting there to be more sell-off. In fact, what happened right away, I mean, you guys saw it. It happened so fast. I will, um, I'll bring up some charts here on how quick that market turned. Here is your 15-minute time frame. And, you know, this is right where we opened up. Uh, it opened and then just really just did nothing but go up. There was one minor hesitation right around lunchtime, but then it just kept on ripping and ripping and ripping. And that was, wasn't was even the best performer. That was the S&P 500. The Nasdaq's like a goodness gracious kind of chart here. Uh, congrats to all those that were jumping on the tech stocks. Uh, they rebounded quite a bit. But keep in mind that with all the sanctions that they're talking about with Russia, uh, if this does go on for a long time, tech stocks may actually start to feel a bit of a pinch here. And we'll talk more about that as we progress. So it was a, a crazy day to go from a massive winning day in my in that options trade to a pretty significant losing day in the options trade. And I still kept mine. Um, uh, I did not get out of my shorts, Rob. It was, it was a debate. I was really fighting the urge. I was like, okay, my game plan, and I usually stick to my plan, was to wait two to three days. And unfortunately, I may have missed it, although I do think that longer term, we'll see this market roll over because it's not just the war, it's also the economy and a couple other things here that I think will long term or in your immediate term bring on down the markets. Uh, Big Eb, uh, did you get out of your stuff today? Did you get out of your stuff? <laughs> Uh, I hope you did. I didn't. I kept mine. I still have significant gains, but definitely gave back a good chunk off of those lows. Now, before I dive into analyzing the markets, which I want to do, um, I got to give a shout out to John O'Donnell. He sent me this one and, and I wanted to post it just because I thought it rained true for today. This is a quote from Ludwig von Mises and he says, the worst evils which mankind ever had to endure were inflicted by bad governments. And of course, we could point the finger at this government, that government, Russia, U.S., Europe, who cares? I think this reigns true in whatever country we are in. And if, if there was, I guess, more work together, um, you know, maybe, maybe governments and dictators and presidents and kings all need to go to like marriage counseling, you know, diplomacy counseling, so we can all sit in a room and have some negotiations and get along. Because I personally think we could have averted this whole thing. But anyway, that's pretty much it. Um, there we go. So let's start off with what happened out there in those markets. Again, we will keep these on an uh, intraday, and I'll bounce back and forth. You can see that just the gains from today 
absolutely massive. And again, NASDAQ up 3.19% making it your best performer. What's more enticing was some of the levels we talked about yesterday, right? So NASDAQ for me was setting a tone for an off to the races kind of down move here. I was really expecting it to sell off even more. Well, we did get that, but then it just about faced and just rallied all day. Now with the Russell, remember we, we weren't at those lows yet yesterday. But we hit those today and then bounced right off of them. Russell was up 2.46%. Uh, I'm going to skip Bitcoin for now and just stick with the indexes. Here's the S&P. Now, for me, this has still not officially closed below 4,200. As I told you, that is kind of my line is 4,200 is the line I feel for the S&P is going to be the break point. A close below that, then we'll start to see um, more weakness, in my opinion, pour into the, into the S&P. Just didn't happen. Right, we were all the way down to 4,100 today on the S&P, finishing at 4,280. So I mean, a massive 180-point swing in the S&P is absolutely huge. There was just so much opportunity in the S&P. Now, the Dow also posting some gains, but nowhere near. It is, for all intents and purposes, a monster hammer formation. I've mentioned this many times. This is actually my favorite pattern out there. When you have a hammer formation like this, after a massive decline with very high volume, it usually means you're going to see a rip to the upside, right? So I'm going to just move these lines so we can see what it looked like tomorrow. You guys can see the high of this candle that formed today on the Dow futures. <clears throat> that high was at 33,205. So I'm going to move this line. <clears throat> Sorry, I've been talking all day. Uh, let's go to... Coordinates, and we go 33.205, not 0.025, okay, 2.05. So if we can get a break above that line, there might be some bigger upside movement here. So I'll be uh, really careful with this tomorrow. I move my stops down to protect those profits on my options so I don't lose them all. I have some significant gains, but I definitely don't want to let this thing rip all the way back up to these levels. You guys might remember for the S&P, my line was... Oh, uh, it was, <laughs> I believe it was uh, 44, I, I can't even remember what the heck that level was. Uh, it was right above here. So it was above 4,600. So I'm not going to let it get all the way back up there. If it gets back up to probably 45, uh, that'll be a break, an exit point for me to lock in some profits. Uh, Merlin, will you trade YM tomorrow if the hammer starts to work? Uh, if I can, tomorrow I'm going to be traveling. So I have, uh, I'm in studio tomorrow morning recording stuff for Online Trading Academy, and then I have a couple of meetings to get into, and then I am off to Los Angeles to buy seven bikes, which means no show tomorrow. I know it's funny because my uh, my friend was like, "You you you're gonna give up a day of the show?" I said, "I know, I know, it's killing me." He goes, "Yeah, go. The bikes are more important." I was like, "No, actually, the show is more important, but uh, I got to get those bikes tomorrow." So uh, if I can, I will. But the Dow looks the best from a pure hammer formation. I mean, look at the other indexes. Here's your daily S&P. It's more like a, a Thor's hammer, right? That's not really, in my opinion, a hammer formation, but that's just this monster big green ball at the top. You look at the NASDAQ. Okay, NASDAQ, that's not a hammer formation. Here's the Russell. That's not a hammer formation, but that is. That is one that's just screaming. All right, I was uh, just screaming to the upside. So we'll see if that follow through happens tomorrow. I normally don't trade the Dow futures, but I may jump on some of that tomorrow. So that is your uh, your big overall picture. Now, crypto also had a pretty abrupt about face. Bitcoin had a pretty sharp spike as well. I'll bring up the intraday so you can see the move up. Got to love that move up. But that was after, you know, the invasion talk market was selling off and for those of you who are equities traders, yeah, this is a true 24-hour a day, 365 days per year trading vehicle. Not like your equities which close or your futures or Forex that all close at different times. Um, yes, my dad loved the show yesterday. It was kind of weird because he literally, there was a chair right here. So um, in this room, I can't really show you guys. It's kind of a mess right now. Um, in this room, it's kind of, I'm, I'm modernizing it into my man cave, but there's a nice, there's a couch right over here underneath the windows. And it was kind of awkward because I can see out of the corner of my eye right here on the couch, like my dad was just watching me yesterday. And I was like, this is... It was kind of awkward, but no, it's nice. Uh, it's nice to know that your your father's proud of you or your parents are proud of you and you're just doing the best that you can and, um, uh, you know, always makes you feel good. So, yes, it was fun. It was great having him in town. Kind of sad to see him head back up north, but that's it. All right. Uh, so let me run through a couple more things. 
before we jump into I have a slew of questions. So many questions poured in. Uh, Les, <laughs> love you, my man. He, uh, he realizes that the YouTube questions actually underneath the channel actually help uh, my channel. <laughs> so he posted like a dozen questions, man. So there you go. <clears throat> Buy the rip, sell the news. Yep, <clears throat> exactly. And vice versa, Shmev. Vice versa. If you look at what happened today, it's it's buy the rumors, sell the news, right? But with that mindset, I'm so glad you put that in, Schmeff. That's great. If you say buy the rumors, sell the news, that generally implies you're buying something with the thought of it going up, good news happening, and then you sell it on that announcement, right? So in this case, it would have been almost the exact opposite. The, the news was the Russian invasion. If you knew that was going to be a negative impact, it's like short the news, um, uh, short the rumor, buy to cover on the news, meaning it actually happened. So this morning, invasion's going on, you know, happened last night. I was watching it as it happened. I could tell right away because the futures markets just all of a sudden did a really abrupt down, down move. You know right away something happened there. And then all of a sudden, uh, we saw that rip back up. So yeah, buy the rumor, sell the news. That can actually be reversed as well. Buy the dip, sell the rip. There you go. Um, so let me more, more here on these equities. So the dollar index today, this is your dollar on the 15, but the daily is really where it gets interesting because we had a rip back up. I mean, this was a monster move back up with the dollar. You saw it almost kiss uh, 97.80 today, which is that line that you can see here, this upper blue line. That is part of the peak of the range. That was my target. Oops. No, not, not that far back. That was the, the peak of this range back here from 2020 that we saw that dollar kind of chop back and forth in and then the big move down. So nice to see it breach that. But I'll tell you what, if we get above 98, you're going to see some equity market pain happen today or, or when that happens, excuse me. Um, also of interest would be, go down here, some of the interest rate products. Now, they weren't really big movers today, but I'm still bringing these up because it's still kind of traversing above and below this 2% on the 10-year as well as the 30-year. The 30-year is at 2.283 right now. But... Um, you know, to me, this is these pieces, all these little chess pieces, you have to keep an eye on uh, as this progresses to get a feel as to where we're actually headed. You know, again, I still think we're going to see yields rise. I still think you're going to see this dollar index rise. Here's your Dixie again. See that dollar continue to rise, which should put more downward pressure and continue this pattern in the trajectory that it was headed before. So, how will the sanctions on Russia affect the markets? I will uh, answer that from two perspectives. Number one is that one, but I also had, uh, bear with me here, uh, I always like to give props where prop is due, and Les asked this question, so we'll give m m dual credit here. Uh, he says, with economic sanctions about to be placed on Russia, including banking, could the Russians use crypto to get around sanctions? So we'll, we'll do twofold. We'll talk about a little bit about them using crypto and digital assets for that. And then, you know, will the sanctions affect the markets? <clears throat> and I guess I guess the bottom line is you got to look at what exactly were the sanctions. So the sanctions were, uh, were going to not allow technology to be sent to Russia. You really think that's going to have an impact on this market right now? You really think that that's going to hurt anybody in the next month, two months? Now, if this goes on for years, yes. Of course, it's going to have a big impact if they have no access to technology. However, their partner in crime is China, who pretty much has our technology anyway. They just copy it and, you know, um, take our technology. So I don't think that this is any big deal. If you really want to stop this, <laughs> if you really want to stop it, you go after the SWIFT protocol, which is the banking system's way to send money back and forth for big institutions and governments. And you say you are now officially cut off 100% from SWIFT and you can no longer access that. To me, that would be literally going straight for the juggler of Russia. And of course, that's poking the bear or kicking the beehive, if you will. And that could push things into a much bigger escalation because um, I know how I would act if somebody told me you no longer have access to any of your money and you can't do anything with it. It, them's fighting words, right? And, and I mentioned why that doesn't work in America is because we have over 300 million guns. <clears throat> in Russia, you know, that's a different story. And unfortunately, the sad truth is this. If somebody does sanctions to America, I don't believe it would have the same impact as it does on Russia. In Russia, because of the socialist structure over there, I think that you have a small group of people who will feel the impact. That's the big rich oligarchs. And then they'll just 
hurt the lower class people even more. So I think it's unfortunately going to bring undue pain uh, more into the Russian economy, into the people. That's just my perspective. I, I hope that that doesn't happen. But do the sanctions really work? Sure, I think you're going to start to see some issues with it, but that's long term. You know, banning technology from being sent over to Russia is really not going to uh, impact anything for the next few months, six months, eight months, a year. Yeah, Putin warned us not to do that. And that's where, you, you know, that's where you start to get the big weapons, right, Margaret? I know it sounds horrible and nobody wants to see it, but if you threaten a country like Russia and say, hey, we are, you'll no, your money's no longer functioning, we're going to freeze all your assets, which they've already said they're going to freeze some accounts. Pretty sure they didn't freeze them all, um, but froze some accounts and some uh, oligarchs in Belarus. <clears throat> you know, that's, that's where people really um, will attack you. I'll give you an example. I know this is a total tangential piece. Hey, Chris, good to see you. Uh, I was in Thailand and I went to visit my buddy. He was he was there already and I went to meet him at his hotel room. And we get there and he's like, hey, I got to go return some DVDs I bought yesterday. It's like, okay, cool, no problem. So we're walking down Sukhumvit, which is like one of the main tourist areas. And he brings us the DVDs over to this table. And I'm just standing off to the side and it's right on the main drag. There's people everywhere, right on the main drag, two big old tables. And... He tries to return them, and the guy says, listen, just take take five more, because I think there were five DVDs. He says, just take five more. And he goes, I've bought five of them. None of them work. I just want my money back. You told me I could get my money back. So they're bickering back and forth, and I'm just off to the side going, dude, I want to get out of here. This is boring. Let's stop. And there were three little, uh, actually two very small Thai guys and one kind of husky bigger one. <clears throat> and so Josh is you know, bickering back and forth, and I just kind of look at the main guy, and I go, look, if I sold you a car that didn't work, would you be pissed off and want your money back? And he just kind of stared at me and his jaw was flaring a little bit. I'm like, you're smaller than me, man. I'm not worried. And then uh, a couple comes walking down the street and they start grabbing the DVDs. At this point, there's no conflict. There's maybe raising, you know, kind of a little bit of stress, but no physical conflict between Josh, myself, and these three Thai guys. So this couple comes by and the guy starts flipping through the DVDs. And I go, hey, buddy, you don't want to use any of these things. None of them work. They're all broken. Boom! I got smacked with a two by four on the shoulder. Actually, I got a metal pipe on the on the shoulder. Josh got hit on the forearm with a two by four, and we end up in the street brawl with these three Thai guys. The reason I said that story is there's really no big issue between us and these Thai guys until we threaten their business. Same thing going on with Russia. If you threaten Russia or any other country and you cut them off that much and say you can no longer function economically. You threaten their business, and that to me is when the real gloves come off and we have a real ugly conflict. So hopefully that will not happen, um, but you know that's the way you really make a statement and shut things off. To the other part here with Les's question, um, could they be getting around sanctions with crypto? Absolutely. Look what's going on with Canada, right? Canada has basically gone to different crypto exchanges and said, hey, freeze, the account, freeze this Bitcoin account because we know that's for these truckers. And if you don't do that, We'll, you know, pull your licenses here in Canada. You can no longer be in a crypto exchange in Canada. Of course, the exchange is going to go, okay, we'll freeze that account. Now, all of a sudden, we have the main reason why Bitcoin is so important because you technically can't stop Bitcoin. Could they freeze an account at, a, at a, um, an exchange in Canada? Yes. But if it's decentralized, they can't. So there's no way the government would be able to come in and say, well, freeze this account. They could track it and tell every bank in the world, don't, don't honor this Bitcoin address. That's probably not going to work. There'll be somebody who will let that money out. So yes, I do think crypto is a way for them to get around some of the, at least the moving money around and keep their money liquid and the ability to move it around and fund their troops or do what they have to do. Um, but not necessarily around sanctions. You know, if their money's frozen, their money's frozen. They're not going to be able to take their money, flip it into Bitcoin, and then take it out of bank accounts that sit in the U.S. So um, not, I don't think that there'll be a way to get around it. But I do think it's a lesson to all of us of the power of people. And it's saying, look, the, the power that these governments and, and everybody have is freezing something centralized. So we can now impose sanctions on their bank accounts. If we did SWIFT, if we froze SWIFT, meaning now you can't send money through your other banks in, in big quantities, that's trouble. But if I do it with Bitcoin, can't really stop me, can you? So I, I think it's a big deal. I think it is actually a big nod to cryptocurrencies, decentralized marketplaces, and also just a lesson for all of us at how powerful governments can be in taking, manipulating, and uh, kind of doing what they want with, with our assets. All right, let me go back here. I have so many different questions. Um, let's see. Da -da -da. Da -da -da. Where do I want to go to? 
Uh, all right, I'm gonna start with this one. And again, feel free to type in questions. I'm gonna scroll through here. If you are typing questions that you want me to answer, again, start your question with question mark so I can see it and know that it's coming to me. Like Tom did up there, he says, uh, we could remove Biden's bad energy policy that would re-embolden Napoleon, Napoleon Putin. Well, look, uh, again, no government is gonna be perfect out there and whether you love Biden or you hate him, you probably hated the other administration if you love Biden and vice versa. So whatever the case may be, um, you know, you have to look at what is Russia going to do to us that could hurt us? Sanction-wise, I'm going to oh, you, you can't have our energy. Well, okay, most of that's going to Europe anyway, so not that big a deal. Oh, Big Eb, thank you for mentioning. There it is right there, Big Eb. <laughs> uh, it is my Friday, so yes, we are drinking a little bit of uh, Angel's Envy here today, so cheers, I forgot that one. Ah, mm, great way to start a Thursday afternoon. Okay, so this question came in from Les, one of the dozen that came through. He says, does all options stop trading at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or does some trade beyond 4 p.m.? If yes, what trades beyond 4? The answer is no. All options do not stop. Every option that's not a futures option stops at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If it's an option on futures, so specifically an options on a futures contract, which is a big thing. Actually, I know a couple people uh, who are trading more and more options on futures. I'm trying to get them on the program to discuss kind of the ins and outs of that. Those are markets that trade the exact same as the futures market. So options on futures will start trading Sunday night at 5 p.m. and go all the way through to Friday evening, right? That's pretty cool. Yeah, 4.15 for indexes. Correct. You have a small little lead after, but it's not a 24 hour market, which kind of sucks because last night, if you had, like for me, example, for me, for example, last night when that market was tanking, I'll show you the, the chart here. When that S&P 500 was tanking on, let's say, a, a five minute chart, you know, this whole area that I'm going to highlight in yellow, this is all after hours. And that's really where things, this is where the attack started to happen, right? Right around eight, um, what time is this on my clock? I forget what time zone this is on. This is on my time clock. So, um, you know, you can see that right here is where it really started to go south. And to me, that's where the attack happened. You can see the volume kick in. You know, when we got way down here, it was huge gains. And I would love to have gotten out, but I don't have futures. I am trading straight options. Had I had futures or options on futures, I could have closed those out. So there you go. <clears throat> All right, what else do I got? Um, to less again, I heard it said that crypto is replacing gold as a safe haven. Today's move so far doesn't show it. What are your thoughts? Yeah, today's move would, it's almost a polar opposite. Um, if you look at gold, and there are some questions about gold, so let me bring up gold to start. Here's your gold chart, which just kind of fell apart today, uh, which is to me rather interesting. I kind of expected gold to have more of a spike today. It started off relatively strong and then just gave up the ghost here. Range-wise for gold futures, which you normally don't see huge ranges, 5% swing for gold from the peak to its bottom today, um, ultimately ending down just 0.26% as you can see right now. But um, pretty significant down move. If I look at Bitcoin on the other hand, you know that was starting to surge. So it's kind of a mixed signal. Um, with regards to assets here. Now, is gold going to be the one that, oops, I'm not even showing you the chart. There's the chart. There's the gold chart. My bad, I did it again. <clears throat> we'll try this again. There's the gold chart, and you can see uh, the percentage move I was just mentioning since I wasn't showing it to you. There you go. Um, roughly 5% drop. It's almost there. It's almost there. And this is how long the delay is. I think it's 30 seconds. <laughs> you do need a bell. <laughs> there you go. I got to your chart now. Uh, I know, Gallo. It's the whiskey. I have one sip of whiskey. Next thing you know, I'm not switching charts anymore. <laughs> I'll have another sip. Maybe a double negative will work. So there's that big move that happened from, uh, I'll call it basically 2.50 in the morning all the way through 11.30 today, just nothing but down 5%. That's pretty significant for gold. When I look at Bitcoin, on uh, pretty much the same time frame, here's the Bitcoin futures, it, it was the exact opposite. And you would think that they would they would kind of run in tandem if in fact gold or Bitcoin is the new gold. I don't believe that Bitcoin is the new gold. What I believe is that Bitcoin will eat away at some of gold's store of value uh, historical uh, weight. So now I'm seeing a lot of people who are historically big gold bugs saying, you know what, 
let's say I've got fifty thousand dollars in gold. Well, I'll have forty thousand in gold and put ten thousand in Bitcoin, or you know something like that, and and kind of make a hybrid in this um, gold only kind of store of value. So I think over time we'll start to see it have a tighter correlation. But yeah, right now it's all over the place. Remember, you also have a couple different factors. Remember. The markets today are impacted by this war piece and inflation. Inflation, in theory, should actually help something like Bitcoin. However, Bitcoin has its own enemy right now, and it's not Vladimir Putin. Right now, the enemy of cryptocurrency on a high level is Joe Biden. His executive order for whatever happens with crypto is supposed to come out this week. That's probably going to get pushed back. And right now, a lot of people are fearful about what exactly may be um, said or pushed by Biden going forward. So that's really what I think is weighing on crypto. We've seen some pretty significant moves. I still am bearish. I still believe you're going to see Bitcoin hit $30,000. I mean, I don't want it to because I have a lot of Bitcoin, but I think that that's where you're headed with it just until the uncertainty subsides. <clears throat> yep. Um, Jerry says Bitcoin equals 21 million supply level is very tempting. Not only is it tempting, but there will never be 21 million. There will never be 21 million Bitcoin out there. It will be much lower than that. And right now, the industry is kind of calculated that roughly 5 million have already been lost due to people losing their private keys or throwing away a hard drive or computer crashing or something like that. That means that the most we'll ever have is 16 million. And by the time we actually get to the 21, we're finally done minting, they'll probably, my guess, be like 10 million Bitcoin. So in that case, it's almost deflationary with regards to the creation of Bitcoin. Pretty exciting stuff. All right. What else did I have? There were some other questions coming through here. Uh, I know I didn't see my screen. Um, the weak the weak policy has reduced energy supply from the U.S., causing a rise in price, making USSR the Middle East the most powerful and emboldened. Well, yes. Um, but remember what happened to our fracking industry and oil industry in the United States. The higher those prices got, all of a sudden we started to see fracking companies come online. And my guess is we might get a little bit more leniency with regards to regulations for frackers, therefore bringing more and more energy back into the U.S. so that we're not as reliant on you know, the Middle East or uh, Russia. Now, let's be honest. Actually, the trivia question, where does the United States get most of their oil from? Who's our number one uh, importer of oil? All right, we import from who? Number one, who is it? It's kind of, most people are just like, oh, really? I thought it was, the, I thought it was uh, you know, Saudi Arabia. It's not. Right? It's not even close. So I, I think that if, if we start to see issues with oil, we could fix some of that by being relatively lenient on frackers and getting that oil supply out. Now, granted, the oil is very different than what you're getting from the Middle East. There's different grades of it. But Tom is right. Our number one is Canada. That's where we get most of our oil from. Um, yeah, not OPEC. Not OPEC. Not Saudi Arabia. It's Canada. Number one importer of oil in the United States is Canada. Yet all we talk about is Saudi Arabia, OPEC, and the Middle East, right? It's kind of crazy. Hey, Sean. Welcome to the show, my friend. Hardly ever see you over there. Not saying Russia. It's definitely not Russia. Now, obviously, Russia is a massive exporter of petroleum and natural gas, right? But it's not to us. It's to Europe. Uh, I believe that the numbers I remember hearing are correct. I believe something like... 70% of, if I'm not mistaken, I probably am, but I think something like 70% of Germany's natural gas comes from Russia. So you look at who could be impacted here. You know, Russia all of a sudden has no access to natural gas. Or sorry, uh, Germany has no access to natural gas because Russia says, hey, we're cutting you off because of your sanctions. Now you start to go to that Thailand example again where all of a sudden you're choking people off at business angles. And that's, when, that's when the gloves come off when you get bare knuckle brawls and weapons come out. <clears throat> And you turned down getting more of it from us. <laughs> yeah, there was that was weird. That was weird, David. I will admit. Uh, I can't say. That's again. It's my government. All right. Let's see what else do I have here. Question wise, I got the last question on sanctions. Da, da, da. Mm, 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 mm. Um, hold on. I'm going through trying to find some bigger questions here. There were a couple really good ones. Tom, I, you had a great question on Neon, Neon, which I didn't get a chance to uh, check out. Uh, unfortunately, I did not get a chance to look at that one yet, but I would like to. I want to see more about that. All right, let me see if uh, my memory is so bad. I can't remember. I think we already did this one, but I'm going to do it real quick because Jeff says he doesn't remember seeing it. So hopefully Jeff is here. Um, 
when we look at this, I, I'm pretty sure I answered this, but he says, I really like new EV companies. While some of their prices seem so low that there are something I should, is there something I should consider before buying them? Symbols like Workhorse, TSP, FSR, uh, ARL. Uh, ARL is not a, I don't believe ARL is an EV company. So, you know, Workhorse, Workhorse is awesome from a truck perspective. They make some really cool vehicles, right? They, they look, uh, they're basically like the, um, Amazon delivery trucks. They look just like that. And, you know, yes, it looks like a great idea, but what is the chart telling you here? You know, if you believe that they're actually producing these vehicles, they're distributing them and people are using these vehicles, then yes, uh, maybe Workhorse is a, is a buy opportunity at some point. I mean, heck, it's $3.02 right now. That's, that's a very, very cheap price on the grand scheme of things. Now their earnings, as you can see right here, is coming out March 1st, so be careful with that one. But um, Workhorse, out of the group that you mentioned, it would be number two on the list. FSR, which is Fisker, right? Fisker would probably be my number one just because they're established. They're selling vehicles. I see them around here in Orange County. They got a new vehicle coming out, which is pretty cool called the Fisker Ocean. I was checking that one out, but you know, look at the chart. It really hasn't done much. There's really not a lot uh, going on with, with FSR. Now TSP, you brought up TSP, which is two simple holdings. And if I remember correctly, I looked at this one a couple years back, or sorry, uh, last time we talked about energy vehicles on this show, and they are an autonomous driving system that can be applied to trucks, which is interesting. But um, for me, I would say no to two simple, but I do like WKH at Workhorse, just because you, you look at their vehicles and what they're doing. I just don't know who's buying them or how they're selling those vehicles and really what the long-term picture is for it or their financials. So you asked about what considerations would I be looking for. I'd be looking for what does their earnings look like? Obviously, they're losing money and they're probably losing a lot of money. But has it turned? Has the rate of loss slowed? Right? What is the the network for their vehicles look like? Who's buying them? I mean, if all these guys need to do is land a few contracts with Amazon or FedEx or UPS, and all of a sudden this thing will be soaring. But right now it looks like nothing's happening. So I'd want to dig a little bit deeper into the fundamentals on Workhorse before I made a buy on it. Um, don't get caught up in the trap of, oh, it's three bucks. It's got to go back up to 44. That does not necessarily mean it's going to go back up to 44. So that's pretty much it. And then ARL, if I remember, that's a real estate company. American, yeah, American Realty Investor. So this is ARL. I think you might have gotten the ticker symbol messed up on that one, Jeff. But there's a lot of them. And you can look at something like Neo, which was a darling company for a long time, right? Here's another one that has just kind of had a fall from grace. It was at 66 bucks. Now you're at 21. Well, how low can it go? You got some unfilled gaps going all the way back down to like seven bucks. So this thing could go a lot further than uh, it has gone fallen already. And then of course you got. The big dog, Tesla, which uh, had a very nice swing today. Look at that one. Um, you, I know you guys probably watched Tesla. Did anybody see ARK, Kathy Wood's thing? A-R-K-K. -K. That one had a monster day today. Just the, one of the biggest engulfings I've seen in quite some time. And it's a true engulfing pattern, meaning that today's candle engulfed everything from the previous day. All the tails, everything. That is a great one. And it's on high volume. Normally, that is a trend reversal sign uh, going forward, which is par for the course. You guys might remember back in 2021 when we were back at this, I think in the $100 mark, we were talking about ARC and I had a, a funny graphic of a sinking ship, right? Had a sinking ship on it and said, you know, is there a boat sinking? Is the ARC sinking? And bottom line was, look, right now it's just falling out of favor, but the stuff that she's holding will probably do, do well and, and bounce back. So uh, anyway, I'm going to show more of that one. All right, what did I see here? Brandon, uh, with their balance, do you see MicroStrategy as a viable equity proxy for Bitcoin? I do, actually. So the big challenge here with MicroStrategy is obviously, you know, Michael Saylor's a nut job. He's crazy. You know, I love him, but he's nuts. Um, and putting all your debt on the line and buying Bitcoin after Bitcoin is awesome for the long haul. I think it's a great move. It's just market timing might be better. The thing with MicroStrategy, and I have to look up the stat, but I remember reading an article where Kathy Wood's fund owns like 60% of MicroStrategy shares. Like she's buying all that she can get of MicroStrategy as a way for her to get into Bitcoin. So that might be part of the reason ARK did so well. Um, MicroStrategy up 8.75% today and ARK up, I think, about 7 or 8 as well. Um, you know, you could certainly buy MicroStrategy as a proxy thinking, okay, I am now going to be trading Bitcoin by holding MicroStrategy. I believe that that's probably better play than trading Bitcoin futures. 
I, I don't trust Bitcoin futures. They're not even Bitcoin futures in the Bitcoin futures ETF. Right? Bitcoin futures ETF are about 50% bonds and 50% Bitcoin futures. Some are even worse than that. Pretty terrible. All right. Uh, let's see. Is the U.S. now the number one exporter of natural gas? Yeah, I think you're right. Not 100% sure on that one. Uh, Rob, a good question. Uh, he says, China to invade Taiwan. And again, this is not a political show. My opinions about politics don't make any difference. And honestly, the more you make statements about your political preferences, you just make enemies along the way. So it's best to stay out of it. That said, you notice that China hasn't said a word. China has been mute on this whole thing, which I think is very interesting. And it's almost like, you know, they'll wait till the world gets engaged with Ukraine and Russia and backing that up. And then, then they'll be like, and we're going to go into Taiwan and take that one over right now. Hey, if China can go for Ukraine, we're going to go for Taiwan and take that back. Nobody wants to see that, but it would not surprise me in this time. Well, while you've got one war being fought, it's the, you know, if one bank's being robbed across the street and all the cops are over there, rob the one across the street because there's no cops there and they're all busy. You know, it's kind of that same attitude. I don't want to see that, but very possibly. I, I would say if there's a probability scale of that happening, it ticked up over the past couple weeks. Uh, sure, I'll look at Square. And let me real quick, I think that, uh, yeah, here is, just since you mentioned Square, and I'll run that one right now, here's your economic calendar for today. Uh, Square, or Block, I will always call this one Square, just like I'm always going to call Facebook, Facebook, and I'm always going to call Google, Google. Not Alphabet, not uh, Meta, and not Block. So, uh, Square, you notice their earnings report today. They beat earnings by 42% and were down 4% on the day. I'm going to go over here and bring up SQ. And, oh gosh, it actually is right at that level we talked about. Um, ooh, gosh, that is a tasty looking chart. I did not see that. I wish I had set an alert because I would have bought some calls. I would have bought some calls at a higher price than that. Um, wow. I did not see this one. Um you know, I, it's always obviously very dangerous to be catching a falling knife like this unless it's into an area of strong demand, which I felt that, that that area is a fairly decent area of demand for me anyway, the way I look at it. So, you know, is this making a buy point at 95 bucks? Well, it certainly bounced out of it. You'd want to be somewhere in between 90 and 984 would be in the buy point. Unfortunately, I missed that one, but boy, that's a good one. Even on a, uh, a nice earnings beat, they are now down, I see in the post, no, 94, 94. So it should have the post here. Let me see if I can get the post. Oh, wow. It's way up on that earnings. Okay, so it was down 4% and that's when I took the image. They've now, yeah, yeah, you're right. After hours, you can see right here up 26%. Son of a biscuit. This was our buy point too. Ugh. That drives me nut. nuts. Hmm. So there's your after hours. I'll show you in a five minute. Yeah, I didn't see the after hours. I can see the queue up there, but when I show you the after hours, bam, looking great. Um, yeah, when I took that screenshot of the earnings calendar over here, they were down four, so they reported right after that, which is weird that it would have that much of a down move. I guess the second that I caught it must have been like right here <laughs> on that image. Uh, Netflix did not report earnings. Yeah, um, gosh, I'm bummed I missed this square. I actually really, I want, I wouldn't mind owning some Square. I like what they do. Uh, Netflix. Okay, so Netflix After Hours is down a, a little bit, not not too much. Um, as far as from the technical perspective, you kind of have a double bottom, right? We have this gap down. Uh, a lot of people were expecting it to rally back up to this close, or sorry, to the open of this big gap, which would be right around 508, 509. Uh, rallied up a few bucks and now been drifting back down. Right now, you, you, to me, you got a double bottom and you have a bullish engulfing pattern for today. So really, the trade strategy is wait for tomorrow. If we open up below four, uh, below 390, if we open up below 390 and then break above it, there's your long entry. Otherwise, stay away from it. Zed, going to coin, the one that I think should be added to the S&P 500 here or to the NASDAQ. Oops, that's not the one. There's coin. You know, coin been drifting lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. It's one of those ones uh, I actually think when it came out, you guys might know better than me. There was one that when it came out, I was like, this thing's going to go to 150. Oh, no, I know what it was. It was that uh, snowflake. I always thought this one was going to go down. Snow flake, right? Uh, stock. I haven't looked at this one see how bad I, I did. Ah. 
I thought it was going to go to 150. Eh, we went to 186 and still chopping around back and forth for Snowflake. Anyway, I got divert, di, uh, distracted there. Yes, so Etsy. So he, I'll just run through the ones that reported earnings. Etsy, here's your Etsy chart, which is horrible, right? From over 300 bucks all the way down to 120. And now it's up 25% after hours at a buck 60. This may be. You you got to make your own call here, but that this may be one of those situations it's like tomorrow when it opens up to be buying puts on it. To me, it's almost like um, when GameStop said, "Hey, we're doing NFTs," and it gapped up huge, and you realize you made you sold and you're going to sell NFTs, big deal. In this case, this chart of Etsy, um, you know, to me, obviously that trend has been broken for quite some time, and now the trend is to the south side. And if it's already trading up here at 160. You know, I kind of would be looking at 170 mark as an area where I'd be very happy shorting this one for south side move. So, you know, even though we have a bullish engulfing on almost everything in the equity markets today, huge days for so many NASDAQ stocks. Um, the question I have, which I have no answers for, and you guys can all hypothesize on it if you want. The question really is, do we get a big follow through tomorrow or do we rally a little bit and then all of a sudden sell back off as, you know, I think a lot of today's trading was algorithms. I think it was just buy mechanisms automatically kicking in and just buying across the board uh, based off indicator stuff. So we'll have to wait and see. Who knows? I, I don't know which way this is going to end up going. Uh, could I check Raytheon? Sure. Uh, or, sorry, ATH. Yeah, uh, RTX. God, I wish I was RTH. So here's Raytheon. As far as chart pattern goes, you would think they would have done better today as a defense company. Not much of a move. They were up 2.18% today, which is actually worse than the market indexes did that they're a member of, which is kind of strange. Um, all in all, it looks good, but I don't. it's not that exciting to me. right? I've got this nice uptrend, higher highs and higher lows that started back in November of last year, but it's not that clean of a chart. Still trending up, so yeah, I'd be buying it, wanting to, to hold that for longer haul, especially if this conflict does escalate. Um, but you know, when they say technology uh, sanctions against Russia, some of those technologies might be from Raytheon, and they might be from Northrop Grumman, and they might be from Boeing, right? So this, some of these technologies for airplanes and things like that, the government's going to go, you can't, you can't sell it to Russia. And then bottom line is, historically, when we have conflict, Defense stocks do really well, but if they can't sell their technologies to foreign governments, what does that mean? Does that mean that Raytheon might start to struggle? I don't know. We'll have to uh, uh, be careful with that one. So that's RTX. That's RTHs. This is the this is a retail ETF. Um, yep, Northrop Grumman is NOC. So there's your Northrop Grumman. Similar picture, although I think Raytheon looks better. I mean, this obviously has got one hell of a chart, but, um, you know, you've got a lot of chop right now. I mean, heck, for those that watch this show, you know I love the yellow boxes, and essentially you've got a yellow box right there for Raytheon, or for Northrop Grumman. All right, uh, let's see, what else do we have up here? EVBG, I don't even know what that is. Oh, Everbridge, yeah. So they're down 24% after hours trading right now at 34.99. You know why I love earnings. Now, where would it, did it gap down to anywhere significant? Not really. Eh. Yeah, um, I don't know. I don't know enough about it. Technically, this thing is something I wouldn't really want to be trading. Um, if I'm trying to buy this because it gapped down so much, that's a bold move. Pretty risky. All right, I'm scrolling back to see what's going on here. And it's done. ARBL. Arrive. Oh, you mean for the um, for the EV stock? Thank you for that one, Margaret. I didn't know Arrival. So I would put this in the same category as Workhorse, right? I don't know their business on Arrival. I'd have to check and see what what they do, what they look like. But you know, something interesting. This is a SPAC. This is a SPAC that started off at ten bucks. That's generally what SPACs start at. Got all the way up to thirty-seven, and now it's at three bucks. So this is again one of the dangers I see with SPACs all the time. Is I mentioned it. We don't know what whether they're paying a premium for the businesses or or what they're just making a deal, and ultimately whoever's holding the shares are now assuming whatever the financials are for that company are going to work. And, and I don't know uh, Rivals financials. I have never actually looked at their vehicles. I checked out Workhorse quite a bit. Yep, I gather that's an EV stock. Uh, 
<laughs> a nice one, Tom. He says the technology sellers can sell through shady LAE bike importers. <laughs> Damn you. <laughs> All right, what else do I have here? So that was uh, earnings. There was a couple things that were noteworthy for today with regards to uh, economic data. You notice that the GDP numbers came out at 7%. That was right in line with the expectation. Everything was pretty much in line here for the U.S., um, even the new home sales. They contracted, but not as much. So all looked good. This is an interesting one here. You look at crude oil inventories. There's all this talk about, oh, you know, oil problems and supply problems. And I'm looking at $5 a gallon here for cheap gas in Costa Mesa, California. Um, they had a surplus of 4.5 million barrels. So apparently a lot more oil than we thought we had. And who knows if this will continue to grow. But uh, this certainly should help appease a little bit some of the oil issues. Uh, what else do we have? You got re numbers for New Zealand coming out here in a little bit. That's... Um, hasn't come out yet, but that'll be out here in just an hour or two. So anybody who's trading that New Zealand dollar, the NZD, beware of that one. All right, now I am going to have to wrap this bad boy up. I still have questions I got to get to, but I have a bunch of stuff I need to take care of. So uh, if you have any last minute questions, send them on in. I will go through your economic calendar for tomorrow. Friday, I uh, will probably, if I can trade that opening break on the YM futures to the upside, I will try. But there's a big day tomorrow. You can see in the morning, and I cut off the times, unfortunately, you have for the U.S. Uh, PCE price index, which is the big one. That is a monster announcement tomorrow. Uh, durable goods orders as well, personal income and spending. That's all for the U.S. You also have pending home sales and consumer sentiment reports, but it's the PCE price index that comes out one hour before the markets open. That is the most important piece for the week because that is the inflation number that the Fed is looking at to dictate their rate increase coming up in March, if it happens, right? And what do we have? Canada, you got ADP non-farm employment change, and then uh, ECB President Lagarde will be speaking. And then earnings front, you've got a cannabis company, Cronus, you have Berkshire Hathaway, Northern Oil and Gas, and Foot Locker reporting earnings tomorrow. Um, Margaret says, are there more EVs in California? Are there more EVs in California? You mean like EV companies? I know there's quite a few out here. Um, Tom would know better than me, but obviously we've got Tesla. Um, was it Polaris? Uh, is it Polaris out of Santa Monica? That, I know they've got a facility up in Santa Monica. Just saw five dollars. Uh, yeah, five dollars a gallon. That's that's tough. I'm riding that e-bike, man. I'm gonna ride those e-bikes all weekend. Um, what is in Ukraine that Putin needs so badly? Um. It's not necessarily that he needs something so badly. If you talk to Russian, not, not it's a really blanket statement, but a lot of people will talk about the downfall of the Soviet Union, the USSR, right? The Union, uh, Soviet Socialist Republic, Union of Soviet Socialist Republic. When that broke up, you know, it's like they lost a lot of members. It's kind of like, what if the United States broke up and all of a sudden Texas and Alaska and um, Montana and California all did their own things, their own countries, right? It'd be a bit fragmented and you lose a little bit of the pride of your, the unity of your country. So I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I think Belarus was brought back in. I think what they're trying to do is bring back the pieces to kind of bolster their power and their scope. Ukraine's really important because it's right on the water. You know, that's really one of the big pieces of this. Let's bring up a map. It's right on the water. Now, it's not that um, it's not that Russia doesn't have access to water, but it is. We'll go way out here. Thank you, Google Maps, for this wonderful little uh, tutorial. But you look at the Ukraine, right? If I'm Russia, all these areas over here used to be part of Russia. And Ukraine has this big access point to the Black Sea, which gets you easy access to Turkey. Now they got to go through Moldova, Romania, and all these different countries to get there. So that's why they're fighting, in my opinion, why they're fighting. So the, the battles right now are going on in the northern part and the eastern part and the southern, right along this water piece here. And I think part of it is reclaiming that back. The other part is that the Ukraine is asking to be part of NATO and get some protection from NATO and Russia. And Moscow is going, no, 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 no. You're not, you are not doing that. You are not getting that at all. So, um, you know, I think it's reclaiming some of these properties. As you can see Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania here. Wouldn't surprise me to see them kind of going after those as well and trying to bring back all these parts that used to be USSR and bring them back and make a unified country out of it. It's just, for me, it's, it's political gerrymandering, changing the district lines to benefit one political party, in this case, Madrasha. Um, 
Sean, he said, I think it's the reverse Cuban Missile Crisis. America has been putting missiles in the Eastern Europe and expanding NATO. Yep, on top of the sanctions, it's messing with the sovereignty of Russia. I, I, you can make that argument, right? But now we start to go political on it. But bottom line is I think that they want Ukraine back. I think they want to have Ukraine back in their fold so they have access to all this waterway and an easy access into the Mediterranean Sea and all this, all this area over here. Um, I think it's all political, but hey, uh, who knows? I'm, I'm just a trader. That's what I do. So politics is not my thing. Um, perfect Tom. He says, yeah, R Rivian, exactly. Fisker. Fisker was right down the street. Fisker actually came out the same time as, as Tesla did. And if you look at the Fisker Karma, that was their first car. So much better than the Tesla. It was amazing. Um, awesome. Margot, Margaret, did you block Big Eb? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Margaret would have blocked you. Uh, so Fisker, Tesla, there's a ton of smaller ones here. But uh, yeah, there's a lot in California. We're pretty, I mean, it's funny, my dad just came down to visit, obviously, and we're driving around. And he's like, man, there are a lot of Teslas down here. Teslas. I don't really think about that until you leave Southern California. I mean, even going to Northern California, you get a lot of Teslas. But anybody here lives in like, I don't know, Chicago or New York, you don't see a lot of Teslas. They're everywhere down here. Hey, Alpha. Good to see you. <clears throat> Remember the Karma cars? Yeah. Yep. I love them. Uh, so Karma, Fisker was actually bought by a Chinese company. So Fisker is now officially Chinese. Here's the Fisker Karma. Look at that car. That is such a gorgeous machine. I, this one is so cool. Compared to the Tesla, this had style. This had class. And they're, you know, this one just kind of fizzled out and just disappeared, unfortunately. Yep. Yes, they did, Tom. I agree, 100%. All right, uh, what time we got? All right, we're wrap I got to wrap things up here. Uh, I, I have some questions for you, or sorry, from you that I still need to get to, which I'll do on Monday's show. Obviously, tomorrow I'm going to get some e-bikes. I may as well just start a business. Oh, by the way, <laughs> uh, for those of you who are in the part of the Crypto Investor Live program, we created our own currency last night, or this morning. It was meant to be on Tuesday night, but we actually created this morning. Uh, I'll let you know if you can... Next week or two, I'm actually going to be listing it on exchanges and getting to the point where we can trade this thing. We created the World War III coin today. WWIII is the ticker symbol for the coin. I thought we had some fun with that. Anyway, the things we do in our crypto program, some weird things. But uh, yes, we were uh, creating our own cryptocurrency out there, which makes it lots of fun. All right, everybody, that's going to be it for me. Uh, I'm going to go off and uh, finish my glass of whiskey here. So cheers, everybody. I hope that your portfolios are safe for tomorrow, and I hope your necks are doing fine from that crazy whipsaw volatility that you had going on in this marketplace today. My guess is it's going to continue. Uh, who knows what the next shoe to drop will be, whether it'll be a huge down day or another big up day. Volatility is here for a while until this is completely resolved, and I don't think that it's going to be resolved for quite some time. So cheers, everybody. Thank you so much for your support. If you have questions, send them in at TraderMerlin at gmail.com or put your comments down below the YouTube video that will get answered first on Monday's show. Take care. Have a great weekend.